So uh, these are my disclosures. I give some advice to a few pharma companies have served on uh, safety review boards for uh, GSK and Adaptimmune, which are cell therapy uh, companies, and also have received uh, research funding for clinical trials from Merck and a company called Takara Bio. So melanoma, as, uh, uh, as Annette was mentioning, is a disease which is, has been increasing in incidence, and as long as we still have children of the 60s and 70s uh, out there and 80s, we probably will continue to see an increase in melanoma. We also have a lot of patients who, uh, or there's, people are aging, so we have more and more opportunities for melanoma and other skin cancers. And uh, in 2017, 4,000 men and 3,300 women uh, were diagnosed with melanoma. Uh, that means that the incidence is uh, high. It's related to sun, and men tend to be outside a little bit more in general than women, so that's why we have a 1 in 56 versus 1 in 74 uh, incidence. The, uh, the rate of melanoma deaths in Canada has been increasing, all the, uh, and this up to 2017, due to the numbers of patients. but. Uh, in the U.S., they're seeing a, a, a decrease, and we probably will see the same here, where the uh, current effective treatments are reducing the chance of dying from the disease. So even though we're getting more and more melanoma, either by surveillance, we're catching people early so we can cure them before they're diagnosed, or we're able to treat and prevent relapse, or we're able to uh, treat metastatic disease more effectively. Um, so, unfortunately, there still is a chance of de dying from melanoma, even with the effective therapies, so that's a very important for us to, to monitor. And this is just a figure of what I was mentioning before, that the incidence is increasing because in the mid-20th uh, century, people were doing a lot of sunbathing and exposing themselves to the opportunity to make melanoma. So. Uh, in terms of the biology, a melanoma is a disease which has an, uh, it's the melanocyte, so the skin pigmented cell, has an abnormality uh, in, I don't think this is a laser pointer, but uh, there's an abnormality in uh, one of the signaling pathways. It's basically kind of a phone tag mechanism on how a tumor cell or a regular cell is able to see what's going on in the environment to tell the, the cell whether to grow or to be quiet or not. And there's this phone tag system of, of phosphorylate, these sort of fancy proteins, phosphorylated proteins, which then uh, send a signal from the outside to the brain of the cell, the nucleus, to either grow or not. And in melanoma, the, this pathway called the MAP kinase pathway is often abnormal. And uh, the most common mutation in melanoma is the BRAF mutation, but there are other mutations that can occur that result in, uh, in this uh, overactive uh, uh, signaling pathway. And it's sort of like, for a normal cell, it's a regular car that just kind of chugs along and does its thing. But with cancer the, and melanoma, the signal is revved up so that it's like a sports car and it's able to run and proliferate and go fast. So things completely changed in the early 2000s when we developed, not we personally, but globally, you, me, all of us that have tax dollars that support research, that we developed methods for targeting this abnormal protein, the BRAF mutation, that occurs in about 40% of melanoma patients. And this, uh, this molecule targets uh, BRAF, only BRAF, so the it's relatively well tolerated and it shuts off the signal for the melanoma cell to grow in patients who have this mutation. Um, and you can see a little um, uh, medicine in the BRAF gene. So that BRAF gene is mutated, it's always turned on, but when the medicine gets in there, it prevents the signaling and then turns the, that signal off. And a lot of melanoma cells are dependent on that signal and stop growing and actually shrink. Unfortunately, there's a, um, there are other pathways like this thing called the PI3 kinase pathway, which is on the right. There are other ways for the cell to, to get growth signals, 
and unfortunately that's an opportunity for the cell to develop uh, resistance. So this is a figure just to teach you guys a little bit about survival curves. So uh, these are things that medical oncologists look at all the time because we're trying to choose therapies based on whether there's a difference between the lines. And, and, it's, and there are two main things to look at. One is sur uh, overall survival. So when people talk about um, having more, you know, five months more survival, it means some people get five months more survival. Some people probably get less than five months more survival, and some people get less additional time. But what it, it, uh, this figure shows on the 50% range, so this is 100% of people are alive at the beginning, and then over time, if someone passes away, the, the curve decreases. And on the bottom, this orange line is patients who got chemotherapy, decarbazine, which we used to use. And on the top yellow line are the people that we got Selberaf or Vimurafenib. And at the 50% mark, 50% uh, uh, of patients who got Zelberaf were alive uh, at 13.6 uh, months compared to chemo where 9.7 months patients were alive. So that means when you, you that's like a four months difference, right? So it's not that everyone gets four months. Some people get more than four months and some people get less. The thing that's interesting or important to note about the single agent BRAF medication is that at the end of the day, two years later, the same number of people were alive um, as were the people that got chemotherapy. So while it helped, and it was a big deal, I mean, oh my goodness, there were people on the news because they, were, they had to be riddled with tumor and everything melted away, everything was great, but it was heartbreaking because, you know, two months later, the patient was riddled with tumor again and passed away. So there was a lot of hope, but then it didn't last for, for a very long time for many patients. And this is just where the crossover or the where you can show the difference in the survival. <clears throat> so what, uh, and the reason why this was a problem is that there are multiple ways that the tumor can figure out to get away, get around the single agent BRAF medication. So there's this thing called CRAF and, and other signaling through, the, through that uh, molecule called MEK and the PI3 kinase and other mechanisms um, that are diff make it easy for the tumor cell to get around the targeting of the single agent. So what uh, the community then did is that at the same time, patients, because MAP kinase pathway is activated in all melanoma tumors, um, or in most melanoma tumors, um, there was another drug, uh, the MEK inhibitor, the MEK inhibitor. There's an example, trametinib. It targeted a downstream molecule called MEK, whereas the mutant BRAF, that's the top purple one, uh, was targeted by uh, dibrafenib, which a lot of people are on now, or vimurafenib, which is the older drug, Zelberaf. So uh, what uh, was discovered is that there was activity in trametinib in melanoma, um, a little bit of activity, but not a great drug. But when you put the two together, you got even better responses and you had less resistance developed. So um, the big phase three studies were done that compared the combination com compared to a single agent, and that's where you saw a big difference in the curves. So there are two different types of curves that medical oncologists pay attention to. One is overall survival, which is on the right. So that incorporates treatments that you get later, because if you don't die, if something else rescues you, even though the disease grows, then the curve stays separate. But if, um, and it's what really we care about is survival. We don't, progression-free survival might be important if progression means that you're in a lot of pain, but if, if the cancer's not bothering you and it's not bothering me, it's just a something on the CT scan, but you don't die from it, then progression-free survival is something that the regulators use, we pay attention to, but it's not as important as overall survival. But in any case, you can see on progression-free survival that patients do a lot better compared to the bottom curve, which is single agent uh, uh, BRAF inhibitor compared to the com combination. And uh, this is data that was just uh, presented where patients with targeted therapy can live, the majority of patients are now alive five years later on one of these combination studies if they had a normal LDH and if they had minimal disease, if it was just you know three or less organ sites were involved, not brain mets, but 
three or less organ sites involved in a normal LDH. So these patients usually had low volume disease. The uh, majority of patients are fine five years later. Um, um, and a lot of the patients had no progression. Some of these patients are alive five years later because they got immunotherapy, although these studies were done long enough ago that they didn't have the kinds of immunotherapies we now have available. So we do think that the targeted therapy makes a big difference for, for some patients, but it's a selected group. The big problem is the patients that have lots and lots of cancer have a really good chance of responding to targeted therapy, like 60 to 70 percent of patients will have the tumor shrink, but it doesn't last. With target, with combination therapy, the average is 11 months or so, um, and the patients who have bulky disease tend to have shorter remissions. That all being said, it's still a very important drug, and it can, it can sometimes take someone who's destined to die soon and, and actually give them extra time so we can then marshal other treatments for them. So immunotherapy has really made a big difference, and it uh, has a lot to do with the fact that you can, uh, res you can have long-term benefit. And uh, around the same time that targeted therapy was developed, we saw uh, great strides in immunotherapy with engineered cells as well as with the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, it seems like it's all something that showed up in the last 10 years, but it's actually a therapy that's been it researched for over a century, uh, going back to the late 19th century. There was a period of time in the mid-20th century where cytokines were investigated, high-dose IL-2, lots of side effects, but a few patients had responses. And then in the last uh, 15 years, we've really hit upon a few home runs where patients are having significant benefit from therapy. So what the immune system does is it recognizes cancer and in most cases of patients who have cancer that's, uh, that we detect, obviously the immune system hasn't prevented it from advancing, but the immune system is recognized, sorry, the tumor is recognized by the immune system. The tumor recognizes little aspects of the cancer that are different from self. They're called antigens. The, uh, the, the, the garbage men and uh, policemen of the cell, the, the, the dendritic of the, of the body, the dendritic cell picks up uh, these antigens, presents it to the immune system, and then the immune system can stimulate T cells, which are able to traffic back to the tumor and induce an anti-cancer effect. The problem with uh, this response is that there are a lot of down-regulatory elements that prevent our immune systems from attacking our bodies, and cancer is sneaky. Cancer uses everything in its power to prevent the immune system from killing it. So what the, immune, so what the cancer does is it uses the normal ways that we prevent attack against ourselves as a way to prevent attack against the cancer. These new medicines are able to lift that veil to a, to a certain degree so that the immune system can see the cancer and induce a response. The, there are two main types of, of approved drugs that are available, um, and one of them is called ipilimumab, and the other one's called anti-PD-1 therapy. I, I say anti-PD-1 because it's a class of drugs, and there are several that are used in skin cancers, uh, four that are approved for skin cancers, two for melanoma, uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Uh, uh, squamous carcinoma has semipilimab, and uh, Merkel cell has avalumab, uh, which uh, prevent uh, the interaction between uh, PD-1 and PD-L1. And the other drug is called ipilimumab, which is a CTLA-4 inhibitor. So CTLA-4 is the first drug that, that came in, it was approved as, <clears throat> as we were mentioning in 2012. And there have been randomized studies that show that there is an improvement in survival, and the big deal for us and the proof of concept is that these drugs can, can last a long time. So on the left is, a, is a, a survival curve. I told you how to interpret survival curves. It's a survival curve from uh, the end of the mid, you know, early noughts, the 2000s, where all phase two studies in melanoma showed the same crappy response rates, the same crappy survival. The vast majority of patients were dead by three years, so only 5% of patients would be alive. And then ipilimumab, which in randomized studies showed that there was a difference, 
uh, in an expanded access protocol where thousands of patients were received ipilimumab, 20% of patients are alive at 10 years. So that's a major big difference, like 15% more people are alive because of this drug. Ipilimumab has side effects that are a problem. Ipilimumab has a low response rate, but it made a big difference for that 15% of patients who received the drug. And then we've gotten better. Uh, the gray line is ipilimumab in uh, this, uh, this is an older study that Bristol Myers Squibb did where patients uh, received either nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1, ipilimumab, which is the anti-CTLA-4, or the combination. The gray line is ipilimumab. You can notice that that's better than the other uh, uh, the earlier uh, uh, figures. And the, the, re the survival rates keep on going up a little bit because patients have access to newer drugs later on if they fail the first treatment that they receive. So the gray one is, is ipilimumab alone, the blue one is nivolumab alone, which is the anti-PD-1, and then the, the green one is the combination, uh, which is a little bit, which is definitely higher, in my opinion. It's not statistically, for some various reasons, it's not statistically different uh, between the green and the blue line, but all of us look at it and believe that probably the combination therapy is a little bit better the big question is whether or not the side effects are better and because the side effects are a lot worse. And that means that if you would have been fine and been on the blue line, but you get the combination, you have a side effect, well, maybe you would have been fine with the single agent. But that's a discussion that you have to have with your doctor when you're making decisions. So the big problem with all of these drugs, unfortunately, is not the people below the lines. The problem is the people above, because that means that they've developed resistance and the disease, the treatment hasn't worked. So there are two types of resistance to therapy. One is primary resistance, which we see in immunotherapy, basically when the first scan shows that the disease has grown significantly, then you have progression, and that's called primary resistance. But there are some people who have initial uh, re uh, responses, and yet the disease comes back, and that's called acquired resistance. And you know that's a, that's a big problem. So there are a couple of ways that we are hoping to try to prevent resistance. One of them is to avoid uh, development of resistance altogether by treating patients early. So we have treatments now for stage three uh, 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 melanoma that's resected. Targeted therapies approved as well as immunotherapy with anti-PD-1 drugs, and the. Not all of the data is out, but it appears for sure that survival is better, at least with short follow-up, when patients participate on these studies. And all of these patients who have, uh, certainly for targeted therapy, we have survival data, and it's looking very promising. Um, not quite statistically proven, but it's looking promising, and the progression-free survival was good enough that we have approval for these drugs. But for <clears throat> For the targeted therapies, you can see there's a big difference between the top and the bottom uh, line. This is metastasis-free survival, but overall survival is still different, uh, just waiting for uh, maturation to, to, of the data to show statistical significance. Now, the other thing that I mentioned is that there are resistance that develops, and if you have stage four disease and you have resistance, what are the things that we can do for it? So there are uh, so in this slide, we kind of we have um, uh, split up the different mechanisms of, of resistance. The one on the top left is immune suppression. So you have an immunosuppressive environment. You give an anti-PD-1 drug. There are T cells that are ready to kill the tumor, but the tumor does something that prevents uh, the cells from attacking it. One is that it uh, uh, displays other immune checkpoints. That's this LAG3, which you, there are trials that are currently ongoing. Or it secretes something that will downregulate the immune response. On the lower left is uh, poor antigen presentation. Uh, some of the tumors are able to figure out a way to hide itself from the, from the immune system by uh, not presenting the antigen, either by losing the antigen or present, or uh, um, preventing the way the, the T cell is able to, to detect the tumor through antigen presentation. On the uh, right lower is uh, barriers to T cell infiltration. So 
that the microenvironment and the vessels that are present in the tumor are, at, are abnormal. And uh, in some cases, it looks as though the T cells are there, but they're just not able to get into the tumor. So we're developing uh, new drugs to try to allow the T cells to get into to cancer. And the top right is that there are some patients who just have a tumor, but it doesn't really elicit an immune response from, the, from patients. And that's where we engineer a response. You've heard about CAR T cells. Uh, that is very important and approved for patients with uh, hematologic malignancies, not yet ready for solid tumors, but it's an area of, of intense research. So as examples of therapy for uh, T cell immune suppression, um, there are multiple targets. On the right is the immune in checkpoints um, that can be inhibited with antibodies or activating treatments on the left. And there are many, many trials that are being investigated in phase one clinics as well <clears throat> as in the disease sites. Um, we have currently studies with LAG3, but there are other studies being, in, or other agents being investigated in phase one clinics. There are so many uh, trials, in, and there, there are probably more trials than patients uh, currently, but it's an area of intense investigation uh, where we're searching for another uh, success. And then in terms of antigen presentation, uh, sometimes just the, the, those garbage men of the immune system just aren't activated properly or actually may be suppressive. Uh, one way is to, in, and this is the, the study that I was talking to you about earlier, where you inject into the tumor an agent that wakes up the immune system. And the hope is that we can wake up the immune system locally in a tumor that we're injecting, and then the T cells that are woken up will then be able to circulate to other parts of the body and induce a response. And in the study that we currently have going on, patients are getting second-line ipilimumab, and some patients are receiving injections, and the others are just continuing with second-line treatment. And then in terms of, of engineering a response for patients who lack a T cell response, uh, we can either grow up T cells from the tumor for tumor infiltrating lymphocyte infusion, or we can engineer cells where in vitro uh, we uh, grow up the cells and then infuse them as a treatment. Uh, this is an example of a study where we uh, treated patients with uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and we saw some responses even though the patients had progressed on anti-PD-1 therapy and anti-C2A4. And then we also have studies looking at gene-engineered uh, products. Again, the patient has blood that's drawn, and then we engineer the, the cells by um, exposing their, their lymphocytes to a virus that engineers a new receptor, and then the, the, the cells are infused as a treatment. And then finally, the um, barriers to the immune system uh, can be targeted uh, through new pharmaceutical agents. Uh, there's a, a signature called an anti-PD-1 uh, resistance signature, or IPRESS, and uh, it, we believe that this is related to a uh, alternatively activated macrophages, uh, which uh, create a suppressive environment, uh, and there are studies looking at either anti-angiogenesis agents or to um, uh, target uh, a molecule called TGF-beta, and we have a study with uh, uh, that'll be uh, opening soon uh, to try to treat patients who have melanoma that doesn't respond at all within the first uh, couple of months of therapy, then they're eligible for this. So that's actually the worst patients who just have no benefit at all. We have something to at least try to see if we can reverse that problem. So there's a lot of uh, progress that's being made in terms of survival in this curve. Uh, it sort of throws all of the treatments for patients with melanoma on the same curve on the right. The black one is chemotherapy, and the immune therapy drugs are um, the green and the red lines that are uh, over the, the gray line. So if you take all patients all together, uh, it looks like long-term survival is best for the majority of patients uh, with immunotherapy. Targeted therapy is very effective for long-term benefit for patients with low-volume disease, um, and it's much more effective in the short term compared to immunotherapy. You might notice that gray line has a hump and then the curves cross, and that's because patients with widely metastatic disease have a higher chance of short-term benefit from 
targeted therapy, but long term it looks like the immunotherapy wins out. There's a trial that's not yet reported out where you get both together to see whether the combination of uh, targeted therapy, so that's two drugs plus a third drug, an anti-PD-1 drug, whether that will be effective. So in summary, um, the, we need to, to stop the development of resistance. So adjuvant therapy is here to stay. There are lots of people in Canada or who are now getting adjuvant therapy, uh, which in the past we would just wait and watch because interferon, the old standard of care, was such a terrible drug. But now we have two, uh, three drugs, four drugs that are approved, two that you give together and we're waiting on getting approval for funding for these drugs. Um, but anyway, uh, patients ha can have targeted therapy, dibrafenib or trametinib, or pembrolizumab or nivolumab. Currently, if you want to get targeted therapy, the only way to get it is either cash or um, uh, insurance to cover because there's no compassionate program. There are compassionate programs for uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab. And luckily, the immunotherapies, it doesn't matter whether you have a BRAF mutation, so patients are able to get that. There is a, currently a, a phase uh, three study with uh, stage 2B and 2C with pembrolizumab, and um, that's accruing, and we'll, we'll see what the results are that, of that are. The, the future for, um, for the adjuvant therapies, one of the big problems is, okay, so if you have a stage 3A, you have a really good chance of being totally fine. And then you go on to treatment and you have side effects for a year. And we need to identify who's at risk. We also need to figure out who's better off on targeted therapy versus immunotherapy. So looking at, at uh, studying the tumor to identify risk factors and uh, treating patients appropriately is the area of research in that area. For metastatic disease, um, there are novel first-line therapies. Unfortunately, combination ipinevo, while it's a little bit better in terms of survival, has a lot of side effects. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, have experienced the side effects of combination immunotherapy. Um, and um, that's uh, something we're dealing with, and hopefully we'll get better at identifying uh, the appropriate patients and also coming up with a combination or, or a new drug that has fewer side effects. Um, and the novel combinations, I think, will uh, 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 deal with the development of resistance. And in terms of lack of T-cell responses, you can uh, engineer a T-cell for infusion. Uh, there are also vaccines that are being developed. I didn't really talk about that today. There are also T cell engagers, agents that can connect T cells to the tumor and, and induce a response. And then that agent gets metabolized, so then patients go back to their baseline. Um, so, uh, if, if that, I'm happy to take a few questions now. There's been a long history of vaccines uh, and for cancer, and it's, uh, these are what we call therapeutic vaccines as opposed to preventative vaccines. And um, there are uh, studies where patients are uh, receiving vaccines is completely experimental. Uh, the current strategy that several groups are approaching uh, are that uh, if you're at risk for, for developing a relapse, your tumor is sequenced, and then they try to identify the mutations that are present in the tumor and develop a vaccine so your immune system can recognize those, um, those uh, mutations. Um, there isn't anything currently open uh, in our disease site uh, but there are a few of uh, these areas that are being investigated around uh, Europe and North America. Well, that's a good question, um, and I think it's quite different for a lot of, a lot of uh, people, because there are some melanomas that may have taken a long time to develop and others that happen pretty quickly. Oh, but it's, in general, I think it's over years. So those particular associations haven't been reported. There's a, there is this thing called a BAP1 mutation. Uh, 
and a few other mutations that are uh, where people have uh, uh, predilections. So there's an association with pancreatic cancer. There is an association with mesothelioma. The, the, I think that's, unfortunately, it's like an unfortunate result uh, in those uh, particular cases, although it makes sense for someone to review your full family tree to see if, if, um, if there is an association possibly. Hopefully the tumor is completely eliminated and then there won't be an issue. Um, anybody who has a history of melanoma has an increased risk for another melanoma and it doesn't have to be a BRAF mutated melanoma. So if, uh, and I've had patients who have been on immunotherapy and they developed other melanomas so it, it can happen. Um, so one of the questions is always when, if you do develop a recurrence, do you need to be BRAF tested again? Um, but and if a tumor developed again and it was sequenced and there was no BRAF mutation, then we would typically say that was another melanoma. Uh, for BRAF mutations in melanoma, it's necessary for those tumors to exist. And there aren't as, uh, it's, not described to have reversion where, uh, where the BRAF mutation disappears. Um, it's theoretically possible, but it's not described in melanoma. You, some of you may be aware of uh, the breast cancer gene BRCA1 and BRCA2, and there are examples of reversion mutations where an abnormal BRCA gene becomes normal in a tumor, so then all of a sudden it, it doesn't, uh, 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 the, it stops being uh, responsive to treatment. So, the re so in general, if a patient's getting immunotherapy, we would anticipate if they had a relapse of their disease that they would be sensitive to, uh, to uh, the uh, targeted therapy. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.